I'm just wondering if there is any tendency in uh, uh, Northern Irish uh, government uh, about course to independence or United States Irish Republic kind of after Scottish independence. So. Well, Obviously, the two main parties in the North government would be, uh, one, my party would be for Irish independence, United Ireland. The other largest party, which is the Unionist Party, want to remain with the United Kingdom. So there is a, an absolute schism on that issue. But we have had to agree to work every day on the economy, on the health, on education. So working together shows a better example to the wider community that whatever our main political objectives are, we still have to cooperate on a day-to-day -day basis, on a pragmatic basis. So our job as a political party wanting United Ireland is we have to try to convince more people in the public that we are good and effective in government, that we are fair in government, and that we will treat people as equal so as if we get a United Ireland, those people will not be discriminated against in the way in which we as Irish nationalists were discriminated against. So there are those tensions, absolutely, but we try to manage them. My question for both uh, Mr. Curran, Brian Curran and uh, Dr. Genghis. Uh, I just want to know, or is it possible to, to start negotiations for peace without removing PKK from the list of terrorist organizations, I mean the Western list of terrorist organizations, or from the domain of the discourse of terrorism by the Western countries who are well supporting the Turkish state by selling weapons and uh, uh, an active diplomacy to cover its war against the Kurdish people. And uh, I, I also need to listen to your recommendation if it's possible regarding what Kurds should do to, in, this, in this concern to, to, to remove PKK from the list of terrorist organizations, the Western list of terrorist organizations. Is it possible that PAD, this is my opinion, which is the Kurdish branch or the PYD, the, the, the uh, Democratic uh, Union of Party or Democratic Union Party of Kurds in Syria, which is affiliated or sympathetic to PKK, can play such role in the Western arena. I mean, a diplomatic role to to push towards that, this, because the Western allies are, have similar interest in the, 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 in establishing Syria in secularism uh, basis, which is mutual but between both PAD and the Western allies. Well, to be honest, uh, the post-9-11 uh, international context has been used by Turkey to its advantage quite uh, well and, and used to marginalize the PKK and the Kurdish movement in general because they're saying to, say, for example, the BDP that you are supporting the terrorists. So that delegitimizes Kurdish movement and it makes it very much more difficult to negotiate or to create some kind of a breakthrough in, in, in this stalemate. Uh, it, it will have to, I think in order to resolve this conflict and uh, it, what needs to happen is a, is a more comprehensive approach, which part of which will be to remove the PKK from the terror list and to accept it as a a legitimate actor in the region. So in a way, what I, I agree that it needs to be part of also a de, desecuritization of the conflict. So the PKK's use of violence needs to somehow end, but it needs to be part of a negotiated settlement rather than to be expected to just end. Um, Yeah, I think the question came to me as well. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> I spoke about political perception and how that really takes the focus away from the real political conflict. And if I can just go back to the situation in South Africa where communism was put forward as the, the big issue, um, 
Fortunately, in 1989, the Soviet Union collapsed. Was it 88 or 89? Well, it was at around about, it was just before then, but around about the time of the collapse of the Soviet Union, almost immediately after that, uh, communism became a non-issue. And suddenly we could really start focusing on what the real, real conflict was, what the real issues were. And uh, the international community obviously also in time uh, understood that the ANC was not a terrorist organization committed exclusively to, to violence or not willing to negotiate, in, engage in a, in a peaceful uh, process. And they, the ANC, African National Congress, did that through opening up literally <coughs> alternative embassies all over, the, all over the world where the ANC would then have a voice to, to, to put forward uh, their message. In the Basque conflict, um, the, the issue was always at a violence there's no political conflict. That was used to ensure that there was not a political movement um, in the Basque country that uh, could participate in democratic politics. Batasuna was banned. Since ETA have declared a permanent ceasefire and stated that they've ended their armed struggle, a new political party, Sortu, has now been registered uh, for uh, uh, pro-independence left through an alliance with other groups, a political group called Bildu has been formed. They participated in the elections on the 21st of October and they got a high percentage of the, of the vote. They're now participating in government. They are now helping to drive a process to put onto the agenda through their Basque parliament the, 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 um, the content of the political conflict. And I must tell you that the leader of the PNV, which is the more moderate nationalist party who's going to become the next president of the Basque country, uh, is engaging constructively with them. So, I mean, in, in that context, certainly the disappearance of ETA um, as, uh, as an, and violence as an issue has made a huge contribution towards enabling the focus now to be on the real political conflict. And, you know, I think that maybe it would make a difference. Um, I, I don't know. You would know better than, than, than I, but it, maybe it would make a difference. And maybe uh, negotiations without the threat of violence or the possibility of violence or the possibility of the termination of a ceasefire may take away that political deception and enable the focus to be on the real sort of uh, essence and substance of the, uh, of the political conflict that exists. From the table, yep. um, there was a couple of questions, I think, directed also uh, to myself. And I would say from the start that it really is a matter for all of yourselves and others as Kurdish people to decide what's best way forward for yourselves. But in our conflict for many, many years, the international community and the media presented our conflict as sectarian. Catholics and Protestants killing each other. They've been doing it for hundreds of years. You never resolve that. Of course, that was not the conflict at all. But that was an easy way for people like Margaret Thatcher and other British governments to present our conflict. In other words, tell people there's nothing you can do about it, forget about it, let them kill each other, and maybe sad, but you can't help them. Um, what we had to do was to find a way to convince people that there was another cause of a conflict. Because if we couldn't get identification of a cause of a conflict, you couldn't properly articulate a resolution to the conflict. And when we went, for example, the main power broker in our minds against the British government in respect of Ireland was the US. And we spoke to a lot of people in America who were very supportive of the concept of Irish independence, United Ireland. But they constantly told us, we're being told by the Irish government one thing, we're being told by another Irish party one thing, we're being told by you one thing. Who do we believe? Who has the answer? We can't do anything until the Irish people say what they want in a more united fashion. So we went as our strategy, and we got the leaders 
of the other Nationalist Party in the north of Ireland, and we got the Irish government at the time to agree a common platform that we could then present to the US and to the rest of the world. Here is the problem. And we started off, we were lucky at the time of the individuals who were in power, <coughs> but we got people to agree from the Irish government, the other Nationalist Party and Sinn Féin what, what do we want? We want peace. We want all party negotiations. And we want the New Ireland based on the choice of the people. They're all very modest requests. But that changed the agenda. And up to that point, none of my party leaders, including myself, were permitted to travel to the U.S. to speak to people. We were all banned from the U.S. I was an elected representative, was denied access to the media at home even though I was elected representative. But once we got that common platform, in other words, that the Irish nationalist and Republican people were saying, here are the three things that we want, that changed the dynamic fundamentally. And we were then permitted to travel to the U.S., to convince the U.S., including the President at the time, Bill Clinton, who was a good friend to Ireland at that time, because he then, as a power broker, neutralised the British government power over negotiations and we had the negotiations and of course I mentioned earlier on we benefited tremendously from the South African experience <coughs> but we had to get a common cause platform that the world could understand there's a solution to that problem and that's what we did and that was a big success for us. My question is uh, to Mr. Brian Kuring and Mr. Alex Maskey as well. It's a bit linked to the previous question, but I just wanted to say you talked about um, having a uh, unified vision and then uh, working um, as the Kurdish movement with the, uh, the movements um, in South Africa um, and Ireland. So get learning about the experiences and cooperating together because we're clearly ha struggling to uh, gain international attention uh, as much as it's needed and we, we clearly need to uh, learn from your experiences. I just wanted to know if there's been, um, in your opinion, sufficient proposal by the Kurdish movement to do so and if there was, um, we, uh, how much you think you can help um, help the Kurdish movement, um, and what you think we need to do uh, to make our voices heard, to be heard louder in the international community? Why are we struggling to do so? I think that, I mean, Alex has given you some interesting anecdotes about how Northern, the north of Ireland went about uh, internationalizing their conflict. And um, I could give you similar anecdotes about how it was done in South Africa. I think what you, what you could learn, you could, you could learn lessons from South Africa, but northern, north of Ireland and South Africa are small fries in the international scheme of thinking when it comes to, to being influential in, in the sort of international support that you need for your conflict. You've got to identify the major role players, the big countries, the powerful ones. And you've got to identify them against their interests in peace in the Middle East, their interests in the outcome of the turmoil that's happening in the four countries that, that and has happened and is happening in the four countries in which uh, Kurdish people find themselves. And work out your own strategies about you know, what, what, what are the buttons that you need to push in order to get the support and the sympathy and work out a strategy for yourselves as to how to get that international support. Because international support is absolutely critical. If you've got international partners, I believe it can go a long way in helping to, to present the, 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 the conflict and get that sort of credibility of the cause which, uh, which, which Alex was, was, was speaking about a, a moment ago. So, I mean, that, that's really all I can say on, on the issue. Just speak up. Okay, yeah. my name is Paul Byrne. Yeah, it's very interesting. I want to talk about international support as well. I think that's absolutely central in South Africa because the apartheid was so unpopular, so wrong in terms of the world. It was such a cause celebre. We had such a mass movement in this country, a very popular movement, supporting black people in South Africa against injustice 
which they suffered. That played a major role, I think, in... In, in bringing, in bringing the, that, 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 that key solution, which we all referred to, we have to create a situation where the oppressor stops just talking about um, uh, uh, the nonsense they talk about and realise it's a political problem. Equally, um, Northern Ireland was, 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 was very similar. Again, there was, a, there was a solidarity campaign with the, Catholic, with the Republicans, the Catholics in the North, with the hunger strikers in the North. It wasn't a popular argument to put in this country, but that argument was put, as you described it, it was put very powerfully through America. Now I think, when you look at Turkey, there's a situation there in Turkey. I, I, I believe the key question is, in Turkey, is that the Turkish state, it's a, it's a rotten state, it's an, a very oppressive state right from the beginning, but it's been supported by Britain and America for a long time. Why? As you referred to it, communism, when the USSR existed, Turkey was a NATO-supporting state, and basically there was all kinds of dictatorships all around the world in those days. They just, you know, they would, Britain and America would, would put up with anything, and it remains the case in the, in the, in the, in the in the, in the post-9-11 world that Turkey is seen by the Britons, British and Americans as a friendly state and so on. But, you know, there are, you know clearly things, things are changing. The situation in Syria has changed things. The hunger strike taking place in Turkey has, uh, has changed things. But that won't be enough, I don't think, to shift the British government. The question I'd like to ask, really, I'm, I, I, I live in North London. I'm a trade unionist. I'm a socialist. I mean, I and many other people would like an opportunity to support the hunger strikers in Turkey. We'd like to get a situation where we tell our government that, that, that we have to state the fact that there's a political problem. They have to go through the kind of process of truth and reconciliation. The starting point is to say that injustice has been carried out in Turkey against the Kurds, and it has to stop, that it's the, the that the PKK needs to come off the terrorist list and that Ojlan needs to be released. That's a campaign that has to take place on the ground in this country. Okay. Do you agree with what I've said? <laughs> Mr. Burian? Uh, you mentioned in your speech that the biggest uh, problem in the uh, Turkey regarding to uh, Kurdish question is that Turkey doesn't uh, admit there's a problem there. Now the question, we know that Europe and uh, US and the, the West uh, uh, countries know that there's a problem. Why Europe doesn't put pressure on the Turkey to bring them on the table and negotiate with uh, Kurdish? Uh, is it because Europe has more interest in Turkey than Kurdish. Uh, I hope to hear your view. It's possible that they have more interest in, in Turkey than in, 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 in Kurdistan. But I think another reason may well be um, when, when countries raise the red flag of terrorism, you find that certainly... Western countries, European countries, stay away. I mean, the Basque is a perfect example. No, none of the European countries were willing to say anything about the issue of the Basque conflict in Spain because Madrid always put up the flag of terrorism, and when it's terrorism, post-9-11, you don't say anything. You allow them to, to deal with their own internal terrorism. And it may well be that the Western European countries are saying, well, you know, we don't want to get involved because there's a, a terrorist organisation. I don't know, but it's, it's possible that that is part of the thinking within, uh, within the European, uh, powerful Western European countries. I only wanted to follow the issue of the terrorism issue for all the movements. For? For the movements, not just for the Kurds, for the Basques, for the Kashmiri, in fact, in a global situation. Yeah. Because the issue here we face is not an individual question just of the Kurds. It's a question of foreign and security policies worldwide. And in specific for the Kurdish movement on the European and international level. So wherever you go, so if you are raising the question, an international, our friend from Ireland, in the U.S., the problem is 
that the U.S. policy after 9-11 has equally changed in relation to terrorism. Mm. And it's not just that people cannot travel over there, mm. but they're actually banned from even getting there always. Mm. Right? So we have individual curtains. But what we are facing here is a global strategy. So the Kurds are operating in a very different situation. They are not operating when it was South Africa. Although we could say that the ANC was only uh, de-banned, I think. If, I don't know. I was told a, a year ago or whatever. But the issue is also even in Ireland, although we have looked at the history with the Prevention of Terrorism Act, it's quite a different situation, the introduction of the terrorism laws in 2000. And I do want to tell our Kurdish friends there is a campaign for 12 years, which we had started in 2000 against the UK law here in Britain. And the BKK and the Kurdish movement were in front of this, there were 5,000 of us outside the Home Office. Now, the issue has not gone away, and I'm not saying it is the only issue. Of course, there have to be these processes of discussion and the identifying of how can we actually change this political thing. But I have to say, the Kurdish movement has to take steps also to de-ban the PKK as a whole. Not just the Kurds from Turkey, but all the Kurds, united. It's not a question of just one movement. What I fail to see here is, whatever happens in Western Kurdistan has to be supported by all Kurds in all parts in the diaspora. <laughs> This is the issue here you should be discussing, not abstract issues. I have been involved 20 years in this movement. No, sorry, 28 years, 30 years. 1987, I have grown grain hair on this. And I, and I think I should have the opportunity to say this here. And I really think that if we are talking about, we have to campaign against criminalizing communities. Take the people who do support you by the hand. But the lawyers, there's quite a number of lawyers who support you internationally. There's the Halden Society for Socialist Lawyers. And I tell you what, they have just made me vice president. <laughs> Okay. Now, that, the reason I, is because of this, and this is very important sir, we, in relation we have to, to We have to stop because discussed. we have to have lunch okay. and uh, start at 2.30. No, no, so. but uh, the question is, our friends have to agree that they should get involved in both struggling what the Kurdish movement in Turkey, in Syria, in Iran, and Iraq is doing, but Thanks. also to get the PKK off the terrorism list. Yes! Okay. okay, just before we, we finish, can I say that, I mean, what Estella has just said is very, absolutely very important and crucial, and uh, I think that we should use this conference uh, as well um, as a venue to, to exchange uh, ideas, thoughts, and... Uh, and uh, and proposal, and so we can use uh, other, you know, other spaces, other times as well outside um, to, to to meet the speakers, to ask questions to the speakers, or to and to talk uh, to each other.